Israel. Israel is seen in the end times. The Antichrist will make a seven-year covenant of peace with Israel. Many people believe that any fight or trouble around Israel means the end times are near. But thinking like this might make us ignore the real signs when they come. It's important to know that just because there's conflict in Israel doesn't mean the end is coming. Israel has always had struggles. They've been attacked by Egyptians, Amalekites, Midianites, Moabites, Ammonites, Amorites, Philistines, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, and Romans, causing them lots of pain. So why does this keep happening? The Bible says it's because God has a special plan for Israel, and Satan is trying to mess it up. The suffering of Israel might go on until Jesus comes back again. So, just because there's trouble in Israel doesn't mean the end of the world is near. The Bible says there will be a really hard time in Israel called the Tribulation, the Great Tribulation, and the time of Jacob's trouble. The Antichrist will make a seven-year covenant of peace with Israel. Angel Gabriel himself warns of this Antichrist to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he will enter into a binding and irrevocable covenant with the many for one week seven years. But in the middle of the week, he will stop the sacrifice and grain offering for the remaining three and one half years. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until the complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who causes the horror. It might be a promise to be friends, not fight or promise to help if any country tries to attack Israel. This person will stop people from making sacrifices and offerings to God by being against Israel. And on the wing of abominations. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, we learn that a terrible idol-like image will be put in the temple and probably told to be worshiped. Some people believe that wing means a part of the temple. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation, the appalling sacrilege that astonishes and makes desolate, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. The one who causes devastation will come. He will chase and ruin anyone who refuses to worship the image. This will continue until the end when the punishment that has been decided is poured out on the land that is left in ruin. In the last part of the 70th week, known as the Great Tribulation, there will be intense persecution. The Roman ruler called the one who causes devastation will eventually be destroyed by being thrown into the lake of fire as God has decided. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20 And the beast Antichrist, was seized and overpowered, and with him the false prophet, who in his presence had performed amazing signs, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were hurled alive into the lake of fire which blazes with brimstone. The future prince will make a seven-year deal with Israel, finishing the prophecy of seventy weeks for Jerusalem and the Jewish people. Jesus called this the abomination of desolation and said it would be a key sign of the Great Tribulation. Paul also talked about this idol worship in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3-4. through 4. Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, that is, the Great Rebellion, the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and so insolently above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, 
publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Let me explain what Antichrist really means. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which is the same as the Hebrew word Mashiach, or Messiah. So when we say Antichrist, it means against the Messiah. John was talking about a person who has fascinated many people, even those who don't know the Bible. But many people don't know much about this person called the Antichrist. While Jesus was known for being beautiful and charming, the Antichrist will be quite the opposite. Jesus always told the truth, but the Antichrist will only tell lies. The Antichrist will look impressive, be charming, and seem successful. He will appear like an angel of light. In this way, the Antichrist will be a false messiah, unlike the true messiah, Jesus Christ. In simpler terms, even though we haven't seen the final Antichrist yet, there are hints and smaller examples of him already here. These are called Antichrists, with a little a. Even though we often call this future world leader the Antichrist, the Bible has several names for him. He is known as the man of lawlessness and the son of perdition. According to the Bible, at the end of time, a very powerful ruler will come and rule over people. This ruler will be the ultimate example of evil. As we get closer to the end, we will see more signs of this Antichrist's influence, and it will become more obvious. This evil spirit shows up in all these smaller Antichrists. John talks about this figure as a beast, not a dragon like in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. This beast is different from Satan, who was represented as the dragon. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the age-old serpent who was called the devil and Satan, he who continually deceives and seduces the entire inhabited world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. There will be a powerful beast that everyone in the world will be told to worship. In the past, people have often bowed down to images of their leaders. According to the book of Daniel, the person who speaks well will not only use fancy words, but will also speak badly about God. The Antichrist will be described as someone who looks impressive and stands out from others. Many people will be drawn to him because he is charming, speaks well, and looks very striking. The Antichrist will start as a local leader, then become a global leader, a harsh ruler, and eventually he will act like a god. The beast will say terrible things. The Antichrist will make a seven-year covenant of peace with Israel. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 18 Your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol, the place of the dead, will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, then you will become its trampling ground. Secondly, many Jewish people will come back to the land of Israel in large numbers. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 13. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his sheep on the day that he is among his scattered flock, so I will care for my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. He will be their shepherd and bring them to their land, taking care of them during the millennium. This shows how God takes care of his sheep, focusing on what he promises to do for them. Verse 11. I will look for them and find them. Verse 12, I will save them. Verse 13, I will take them out. 
I will gather them together. I will bring them in. Verse 14. I will feed them. There are some thin sheep in God's flock, but none in his pasture. Some people, especially certain preachers, say that the God of the Old Testament is harsh and unkind, while the God of the New Testament is different. But this shows us something else. Number 3. The temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4. Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That is, the great rebellion, the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and so insolently above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. The apostle is explaining why people couldn't be in that day yet. According to him, some things need to happen before that day comes. These things will start after the rapture. First, there will be a big falling away or apostasy. This means that people will completely reject Christianity and abandon their faith. In the future, a powerful person who represents sin and rebellion will appear. He is called the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, or the son of perdition. He will be judged forever. This person will strongly oppose worshiping God and will take over the temple of God in Jerusalem. This makes him the Antichrist, who is against Christ and tries to take his place. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 and Matthew chapter 24 verse 15 say that the Antichrist will do his blasphemous actions in the middle of the tribulation period. People who refuse to worship him will be persecuted, and many will be killed. For these events to happen, a temple needs to be there. There's also the interesting issue of the Islamic Dome of the Rock being where the Jewish temple is supposed to be. Some beliefs say that the building of the temple will start at the end times. It is thought that the Antichrist will rule and the church will have already been raptured by the time the temple is built, with the first part of the tribulation over. However, there will still be time for people to turn to Christ for salvation. In the book of Revelation, John also sees this temple. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. Then there was given to me a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar of incense, and count those who worship in it. John was told to measure the temple and the altar, and to count the people who were worshipping. Measuring here means keeping it safe. He was told not to measure the outer court where the non-Jewish people are, because it will be stomped on by other nations during the last part of the tribulation, which lasts for 42 months. Luke chapter 21 verse 24 And they will fall by the edge of the sword, and will be led captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fully completed. The temple mentioned here is the one that will be in Jerusalem during the tribulation. Counting the worshippers might show that God will keep some people safe for himself. The altar stands for how they will come to him, which is through what Christ did on the cross. Number 3. The entire world and Israel will finally recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, unmerited favor, and supplication. And they will look at me whom they have pierced, 
and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him, as one who weeps bitterly over a firstborn. The Lord Jesus Christ, Jehovah, was the one whom they pierced. Mourning for an only son was the deepest form of sorrow for an Israelite. Number 4. Israel will be regenerated, restored, and regathered. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 8 I will cleanse them from all their wickedness, guilt, by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon, forgive all their sins by which they rebelled against me. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 17 Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give back to you the land of Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 11, God tells the Israelites that he will bring them back to their land one day. He promises to fix their broken relationship with him and gather them from the places they have been scattered. God will give them a new and excited spirit. Ezekiel chapter 11 verses 18 through 19. When they return there, they will remove from it all traces of its detestable things and all its repulsive things, remnants of paganism. And I will give them one heart, a new heart, and put a new spirit within them. I will take from them the heart of stone and will give them a heart of flesh that is responsive to my touch. The promise that we will obey God's commands will come true during the thousand-year reign of Jesus the Messiah from Zion, when Israel returns to faith and receives a new heart. Our hearts were made to reflect God's heart. We were meant to love Him, do what is right, and live in peace with God and others. But God gave us the choice to use our free will, which means we can make wrong choices, just like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. God wants us to choose to love and serve Him. When we choose not to follow God, our hearts, which were meant to connect with Him, become hard. God says that rebellious hearts are like stone. A heart of stone makes it hard to say sorry, love God, or make him happy. Romans chapter 11 verse 26 And so at that time, all Israel, that is all Jews who have a personal faith in Jesus as Messiah, will be saved, just as it is written in Scripture. The Deliverer, Messiah, will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This does not mean there will be a time when every last person will be saved. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Romans chapter 11 verse 29. Number 5. Who are the 144,000? The 144,000 are first mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard how many were sealed, 144,000, 12,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. The book of Revelation has three references to a group of people numbering 144,000. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 speaks of 144,000 standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion and having the name of God written on their foreheads. The third reference describes this group singing before God and states that no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. To understand who these people are, we need to answer a few basic questions. When are the 144,000 sealed? In the book of Revelation, the group of people is first mentioned after six seals have been opened. Each seal brings misery and destruction to the inhabitants of the earth. These events include the appearance of four horses, representing false prophets, 
war, famine, and pestilence. They are followed by a religious inquisition that results in the death of faithful Christians and heavenly signs. Christ prophesied these events in the Olivet Prophecy, which will come due to mankind's misrule and Satan's efforts to destroy humanity. In this teaching about the future, Jesus described this time as one of great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 through 22. According to the book of Revelation, the sealing of the 144,000 will happen after the tribulation and before the wrath of God. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, it is explained that the four angels who are ready to bring punishment to the earth from God are instructed not to harm the earth until this specific group of people has been sealed. These passages indicate that the 144,000 will be individuals who survive the Great Tribulation. They will not be faithful saints who have lived and passed away throughout previous ages. Number 6. In the last days, many will go to Jerusalem to worship God. Micah chapter 4 verse 2 contains an interesting prophecy that people from around the world will come to Jerusalem to learn about God. It reads, And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law shall go forward from Zion, and the word of the Lord, the revelation about him and his truth from Jerusalem. In order to understand when this prophecy will be fulfilled, it is important to identify the context in which it was written. When the Old Testament prophets refer to the last days, they usually mean the tribulation period or the millennium. In Micah chapter 4, the focus shifts from the theme of judgment in the previous chapter to a theme of future blessings in Jerusalem, when God himself will rule. Micah chapter 4 verse 3. This corresponds with the millennial kingdom, during which the Messiah will reign from his throne in Jerusalem. Micah chapter 4 verse 2 teaches that during the millennium, people from many nations will come to the mountain of the Lord, a reference to Zion or Jerusalem. People from all over the world will come to the temple, the house of the God of Jacob, to learn God's law and follow it. It is important to note that the fact that individuals from all over the world travel to Jerusalem does not necessarily mean that everyone will be required to do so during the millennium. It is more likely that people will be able to worship the Lord from any location around the globe. The prophecy made by Micah emphasizes that the Millennial Kingdom will consist of individuals from various cultures, races, and nationalities who serve the King. This prediction is a precursor to the Great Commission of Jesus Christ, which is to make disciples of all nations. Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20 Jesus came up and said to them, All authority all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. Some people believe that the current interest in Holy Land tours is a fulfillment of Micah chapter 4 verse 2. While a trip to Jerusalem can be a valuable and faith-strengthening experience for believers, it does not meet Micah's prophecy. The establishment of the millennium 
will require more than just tourists and travel agents. The Lord himself appearing in power and great glory, Luke chapter 21, verse 27, will be necessary to establish his throne, comfort his people, Isaiah chapter 51, verse 3, and bring about worldwide peace. Micah chapter 4, verse 3, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for strong and distant nations. Then they shall hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, so that the implements of war may become the tools of agriculture. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they ever again train for war. What will take place both during and after the reign of the millennium? At this point in Revelation chapter 20, history as we know it has ended, and John begins to depict the eternal state in which those who have trusted in Jesus Christ will dwell. During the millennium, the people of God will have their capital in Jerusalem and continue to live and work on the earth as we know it today. But once God destroys the earth and creates a new one, he will send that heavenly city down out of heaven to the new earth, all dressed up and ready for her husband like a bride would be for her wedding day. This city will be known as the New Jerusalem, serving as the capital of the new creation when it is finally established. And there, amid his new creation, God will dwell among his people and live among them. As we live alongside our Creator, all sadness, hurt, and disappointment will be gone. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. The ushering in of the eternal state marks the conclusion of God's purposes for the earth on which we live. He is the beginning and the end, the creator and the object of creation, the one who began and the one who concludes. He is the eternal one. Just as Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, so He is the beginning and the end of all. Whoever hungers and thirsts for the fountain of life, salvation, He is the one who freely provides it to them. The idea that God will make everything new may appear too fantastic to be true, but He claims this promise is faithful and true. His people will be completely satisfied in the new creation, which is symbolized here by the metaphor of thirst being quenched from the spring of life's water. When you're thirsty, the refreshing pleasure of downing a cold glass of water pales compared to the spectacular satisfaction that awaits you. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. The one who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Every person who is saved will one day live in the new creation. However, the Christian who is fully committed to the cause of Christ, the one who conquers, will inherit an even greater reward, and God will dwell with him with greater intimacy, as a father does with his son. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable, and murderers and sexually immoral persons, and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God has plans to bring about a number of changes to the life that we are currently living. John refers to tears, pain, and sorrow as former things, or aspects of life's routine that are destined to become obsolete. No longer will it be necessary for humans to wipe their own tears away. 
death will no longer cause grief. The last enemy shall be destroyed. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. John also cited the future things, all things new. Believers freely move into a brand new world with salvation given freely, though costing everything. However, only those who have been saved will experience this new heaven and new earth. Those who have turned their backs on Christ will be punished by being cast into the fiery lake. Conditions there will be just the opposite and last just as eternally. And the only way to miss hell is to embrace Jesus Christ. After a brief reminder that those who continue to sin and rebel against God will spend eternity in the lake of fire and sulfur, also known as the second death, the description of heaven is resumed. Unbelievers, with their unglorified bodies and unredeemed souls, will enter a place where all of their problems from this life will be magnified, with no hope of improvement. They will be imprisoned in the consequences of their sinfulness to varying degrees. Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 through 11. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, full of the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very valuable stone, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. One of the seven angels holding the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues shows John the new Jerusalem. Even though believers will live throughout the new creation, the angel directs John's attention to the new earth's capital. Because it will be adorned with God's glory, this city will shine brighter than a cut diamond. The city's main street will be made of pure gold, and each of the twelve gates will be made of a single pearl. This is where we get the idea that there are streets of gold in our eternal home, not tar or cement, but gold. Revelation chapter 21 verse 22 I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There will be a temple in Jerusalem during the tribulation and millennium. The new Jerusalem, however, will not have a temple because a physical representation of God's presence is no longer required and his direct presence will be with us. The city will not require the sun or moon because the glory of God will illuminate it and its lamp will be the lamb. The presence of God, on the other hand, can easily replace the sun because the Lord has greater power and radiance. Because there will never be night there, believers' glorified bodies will never tire and need to sleep. In addition, we will not become bored. Nations and kings will function in a national context on the new earth, bringing their glory and honor into the city. The new Jerusalem will be the pinnacle of everyone's lives on the earth. And why not, given its magnificence?